Hello friends, James Corbett here, CorbettReport.com, April 10th, 2017, aka 72 hours into the post-Syria strikes world. And yes, the dust is beginning to settle on the crazy events of last week. I hope you've been following all the latest information in the comment section of the Corbett Report's own open source investigation, as the Corbett Report community has been doing real yeoman's work in assembling and collating all this data streaming forth from the news feeds. But in case you haven't been following the developments this weekend, let's just go over what we know, what we don't know yet, and what we can read in the tea leaves about what is yet to come. Firstly, I won't spend too much time on the chemical weapons incident that spurred all of this in the first place, other than to direct your attention to a very important interview that Scott Horton just conducted with ex-CIA officer Philip Giraldi, where he insists that the intelligence community and military personnel know that the intel shows that this was not an Assad attack. Uh, this is further bolstered by an interview that ex-CIA officer Ray McGovern gave to RT, that Fox News subsequently tried to censor off the web. It's a bizarre little story I'll direct your attention to here at 21st Century Wire, but suffice it to say, McGovern says that this that his military sources indicate that the Syrian government's strike on Idlib hit a chemical we weapons manufacturing plant, or a chemical manufacturing plant, I should say, and it was the toxic fallout from that that killed the, citi the, the citizens of uh, Khan Shikun. Um, but as to the strike itself, there have been people throwing a around the idea that the U.S. tipped the Russians and or Syrians off to the strike before it happened, as if this was some kind of conspiracy or covert collusion. But there is nothing hidden or conspiratorial about it. Shortly after the Tomahawks were launched, Pentagon spokesman Captain Jeff Davis confirmed that Russian forces were notified in advance of the strike using the established deconfliction line. U.S. military planners took precautions to minimize risk to Russian or Syrian personnel located at the airfield. And this established deconfliction line that he's talking about here refers to a Memorandum of Understanding, an MOU, that was signed back in October 2015. Uh, an MOU on air safety in Syria. And again, reading directly from defense.gov, the MOU includes specific safety protocols for air crews to follow, including maintaining professional airmanship at all times, the use of specific communication frequencies, and the establishment of a communication line on the ground between the U.S. and the Russians. So uh, that MOU didn't call for specific sharing of information on what was being targeted, but obviously, as per Captain Davis' statement, that was shared this time via the communication line. Now, we know that Russia, Syria, Iran, and Iraq set up the so-called RSII coalition in September of 2015 to share intelligence and establish a joint information center in their joint bid to destroy ISIS. So, let's connect the dots. We know that Russia shares information with Syria, Iran, and Iraq. And although Bloomberg dutifully reports that a Pentagon official said, quote, the Pentagon had no intelligence indicating that the Russians tipped off Syria to the looming attack, end quote, we don't need any SIGINT or James Bond spy shenanigans to put two and two together. They have a joint information center on the ground, for crying out loud. The Russians absolutely let the Syrians know what was coming. Now, this becomes important when we look at what the strike actually accomplished or failed to accomplish. Uh, the runways were not damaged in the attack, meaning the base was up and operational uh, within 24 hours. Uh, this is because we are now told the strike didn't target the runways at all. So there you go. And well, it's mission accomplished because they didn't hit the runways at all, as we can now see from these uh, photographs that have been released. Um, now, Russia says that only 23 of the 59 missiles actually hit uh, the airbase at all, although Pentagon officials, uh, speaking under the uh, customary cloak of secrecy, uh, told ABC News that all but one missile hit the base. So uh, reality might lie somewhere in between or nowhere uh, around either of those estimates. I don't know, but those are the two official lines from the official governments. Uh, now, pro-Russian sites have predictably latched on to the less than half mi the missiles hit the base story, 
to suggest that the uh, super psychotronic 26th century mind control weapons from Hyperdimension X that the Russians have, Jedi, Jedi mind tricked the puny USP shooters into committing Harry Carey before they even reached the base or something like that. Uh, meanwhile, pro-Trumpers who were thrown under the Trump train by the neocon in chief but are still white knuckle grasping onto that caboose with all their might say that this is because the entire strike is seventh dimensional backgammon to make America great again by scaring the North Koreans or Chinese or someone by completely failing to destroy an airbase or, or something like that. <laughs> But then again, these are the same people who think that Kim Jong-un's missiles that have failed to hit anything are an existential threat to the U.S. and probably justify a nuclear invasion of North Korea should their dear leader order one. So consistent thinking is evidently not the pro-Trumpers' strong suit. But whatever the case, this much cannot be denied. This strike, taken as a single, isolated incident, has had little effect on the Syrian government's military capabilities. But, of course, this is not a single, isolated incident. Even if the Russians and the Syrians colluded to allow the strike to go ahead in order to relieve some of the pressure to do something about this chemical weapons false flag event, there have been several very real developments so far. Uh, the Russians have cancelled their Memorandum of Understanding on Flight Safety with the U.S., meaning that the next time a strike is launched or an attack is planned, there will be no hotline for the U.S. to use to tip off the Ruskies to stand down. Uh, the Russian Ministry of Defense has already vowed to implement a system of measures to bolster and increase the effectiveness of the Syrian Armed Forces air defense systems. Uh, Russia has sent the Admiral Grigorovich, its most advanced Black Sea frigate, back into the eastern Mediterranean, a.k.a. the exact area where the USS Porter and USS Ross, the U.S. destroyers that launched the Tomahawks, are still deployed and operating. And, to top it all off, that RSII Joint Command Center that we talked about earlier issued a statement over the weekend, quote, what America waged in an aggression on Syria is a crossing of red lines. From now on, we will respond with force to any aggressor or any breach of red lines from whoever it is, and America knows our ability to respond well. End quote. So, on the U.S. side, we have uh, Trump and Nikki Haley and Tillerson and the entire administration sticking by the phony script that the incident at Khan Shakun was... 100% without doubt an insane President Assad gassing his own people right before the peace talks that would have secured his victory for some unexplained reason. So uh, it really doesn't matter whether the Russians or even the Syrians conspired with Trump to stage this mostly for show attack or not. Everyone is now painted into a corner and one thing is for certain, there is now, virtually no chance that Assad will be allowed to stay in power in Syria. If the Syrian army is on the verge of vanquishing the very last ICISIS terrorist from their soil, or even if the world is ready to sign on the bottom line of some completed peace negotiation to bring the terrorist insurgency in Syria to an end, the precedent has been established. All al Qaeda has to do is stage another chemical weapons attack and blame it on Assad, and the dominoes will fall one by one. Neocon puppet Trump will, as we have seen, gladly sign off on whatever lies are passed before him, and next time it might just be a full-on invasion of Syria. At that point, Russia has to put up or shut up. Uh, even Either that... Um, will lead to that full-on military confrontation between NATO and Russia, or we will know that uh, Putin's red lines mean nothing and the whole rivalry is just for show. Uh, I'd say it would be harder to get out of this without further military action than to thread the eye of a needle, but that assumes that I see any way at all of avoiding that kind of military confrontation, and at this point, I don't. So everything, and I mean everything, is going to hinge on what is or is not discussed in the upcoming visit of Tillerson to Moscow on Tuesday. I will, of course, be keeping my eye on everything here, and once again, I invite the, uh, the Corbett Report community to continue cataloging and analyzing this information in the comment section of this video at CorbettReport.com, link in the description, as always. James Corbett, CorbettReport.com.